Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Doris the Delay Masterclass Series. We had wonderful guests in the past and I believe we had already 12 guests and it's a great pleasure for me to have dear friend, wonderful violinist and uh, excellent pedagogue, faculty of Juilliard School and many other festivals and, and uh, other summer schools including the Perlman program. Uh, Catherine Cho is joining us from New York. Hello, hello. Hello there, Professor. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to see you. I'm looking forward to hearing the students play today. It was very nice of you actually to create this little project among you students. It was really, really interesting for me actually to, to get familiar with some of the students because they created the video, which you asked them to do with a little introduction so I could uh, learn a little bit about some of these students. And we selected two wonderful students to perform today for you uh, mm -hmm. this webinar. So you can maybe tell a little bit about your students, introduce them, and then we can proceed to inviting one of them to perform. Okay. Well, we have uh, one student from the pre-college division. This is Vipa Janakiraman. We met uh, a few years ago when she came to play for me actually in my house. She's from Philadelphia, wonderfully gifted human. And what you may not know about Vipa is that she is a very deep soul. Although you might know, you, I think you will know that because you'll hear it in her playing. <laughs> And she's a very thoughtful human. So she's going to play an excerpt from the Chasson poem for us today. Hi, Viva. Hello, Viva. And before you start playing, uh, the, there will be some bio about the students in the chat. So we can read some of the information about two players today. So I'm going to mute myself and turn off my camera.
Beautiful Vipa. Thank you for playing that for all of us. And as always, your poetic soul is very clear and very direct. And, and I really appreciate the, um, the, the shift in your storytelling since the last time I heard you play it. So I'm really appreciating the development of that very, very much. So uh, I'm sorry I have to stop you in the middle um, so I'm imagining what the next chapters are going to feel like, but can you tell me a little bit um, how your mental energy is um, working and collaborating with your spiritual energy today? I think maybe they're not collaborating as well as they could be, but I'm trying to allow my spiritual energy to guide and my mental energy to then shape things around that based on what specific details I would like to incorporate and certain phrasing ideas that I've had. Um, and basically it's sort of like the sort of logical aspect that sort of can come on top of how I feel about the music. And where are your emotions sitting today? Physically or? Um, are they feeling physical? Are your emotions feeling physical or are they feeling mental? I think a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I like it that way. I, I like it when the emotions are a little bit of, <laughs> in both places. Now, when you were playing just now, did you feel that you were guiding the light of the sound more from the spiritual side or more from the mental like sound wise what was the guiding force i think more from the mental side which is why i said earlier i don't think they're collaborating as well as they could be because i think they're both taking on roles that the other was supposed to take on so i think especially in performance settings Oh, especially in performance settings, I tend to try to have my mind sort of dictate everything and take on all the roles. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not necessary, like in the opening, for example. Um, and I do that because I guess subconsciously I know that my mind knows what it needs to do, what I need to do physically to achieve the end result. Mm -hmm. And so... I guess I think by thinking about things very mentally, it will, it has a higher success rate, even if the actual quality 
of what I'm trying to bring across isn't as full as it could be if I didn't only use dimensional energy. So maybe for today, let's experiment with gathering where our focus is and actually shifting it and then letting it transport itself to another location and then shifting it back. So how about as an exercise, we can start at the very opening. And as you're taking your inhale and you're about to start exhaling, right? Quiet your, your mental energy and draw it down a little bit more into the spirit as the guiding force. And then let's say at um, the next entrance, we're going to do the exact opposite. Gather that and then transport it back into the head and let it actually be a little warm. I know that's not your ideal. That's not our favorite place to be. But sometimes we need to practice what it's like to have a warm head, hot heat up here and reversing that. Okay, so let's start first cool, warmer, and then we're going to shift it over on purpose. Okay, at number four. And just notice without judgment, just notice what, what that was like. And now I have four shift. So just take notice of the difference. I know the music is different too, but how did you respond to that shift, Biba? I think I responded, the way I sort of approached the shift was once I got to uh, rehearsal four, mm -hmm. I started thinking less about how it felt and more about what I could do to produce that, which obviously wouldn't be how I would approach it if I were listening to it, but when performing it, that's necessary. Um, and in, I thought the opening felt a lot more aligned with what I intended to say with it, but I don't think I had that from the first note. I think it took me a measure or two to get into that mindset because before I started my mind still wanted control <laughs> yeah that makes perfect sense let's practice starting it a few different ways let's try it once Vipa where in your inhale you actually take in the space of the entire room including the space behind you okay and then just play that note and exhale the music 
the content of which you took in from the entire space. And then we're going to do a second time where it's going to be just in your own spherical bubble. Okay, so let's do the first time the entire space. And let's do it with your eyes closed so you can really use your other senses right now. Now let's do the second way where you're the axis of your sphere and pay a little more attention actually to where your equator is yeah, and how far apart it is from your body to the end of your sphere. So maybe you can imagine it's like an arm length away and then there's this whole sphere around you and only take in the energy of that space before you play your first note. So I invite you to welcome a slightly more intimate sound, a more internal sound one which doesn't need to be challenged by an orchestra after you uh, pass into the piano and then allow the audience to be drawn into your sphere this time and we'll see what that feels like to you, okay? Would you like me to close my eyes for this? Yes, okay. let's do that again. Take notice of that and now let's play around with this version, okay? Now, as far as vibrato goes, as you're experimenting with different kinds of touch on the string, let's try it once where you almost feel like you're air dropping your fingers, okay? From the air to almost, almost to the fingerboard, but not quite all the way down, okay? And we're just gonna play, let's say open G, ta, and just imagine that you're air touching. Okay, let's just do the down bow and then the up bow and then stop. Because so you're gonna use your left hand, yeah. You know, this time let's do the same thing and let's just tap the string da, 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 on the note that you're going to play. Yeah, okay. And now this time, you're going to let your hand right melt 
your finger into the string. So rather than thinking that your finger is melting, imagine that your palm is allowing the finger to melt into the string and still feel that tapping sensation. And we're gonna add a little bit of rotational vibrato. Okay, let's practice a rotational vibrato. Nice. And this time, let's see what it feels like to use the energy of your chest to vibrate down into this rotational vibrato. So we have a little bit of vertical vibrato, but now we have a little rotational and then maybe we'll add lateral last. Okay, let's do one more version. Beautiful, you notice the difference of that. Now let's do one last version, Vipa. Let's imagine that you're vibrating with your bow, right? And so you're gonna imagine that the stick is vibrating um, both vertically and a little bit in a spiral and let your hand where it touches the stick also feel like it's vibrating slightly against the stick. So you feel this sort of magical electricity in the smaller, um, in the smaller muscle groups, okay? that's something you could play with, right? That gives a little bit of poetry and speaking to your music. Now let's shift over to something really different. Play for me at number five. Ta -ya -da -da -da. After we've had this, you know, eloquent accumulation of energy, then we start to reach a, a bigger part of the tidal wave, right? So from here, play around with how lateral energy on both sides helps you to guide the phrase towards the animato and then we'll try it one more time with the opposite okay with the vertical Now this time let's try with the vertical energy and remind yourself that each downbeat, right, has a, or I'm sorry, each trill is on a new energy plane. Okay, so imagine that you're climbing, you're climbing, you're climbing, and listen for how the note sings through when you're playing a trill. So not the upper note, but the lower note. Imagine you can actually hear it all the way, tom, ti, yo, tom, all the way to the top. Nice. And then Vipa, right when you get to the animato, you really took us with you. So we're, we're with you all the way. When you get to the animato, the energy immediately changes. And I wonder if you could feel the flutter of the movement in the orchestra in this new feeling at the 6-8. And once we get to the 6-8, you did this really well on the, on the playthrough too. You could probably experiment with da, ya, da, ti, da, ya, da, what happens in the subdivisions when you're playing in this 6-8. So it helps us to 
understand the drama of the music from one downbeat to the next. So can we do one last time, actually from the trills and then go to number six. It's so magical, isn't it? How he uses rhythm and harmony beautifully together to create a sense of either momentum and propulsion or uncertainty, or, or it's almost like you're staggering. So I wonder if, ta -ya -da 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 -ya -e, maybe use the tie at uh, 100, ta -ya, maybe to suspend the energy, ya -da, and then ta -ti. that rhythm really helps us to feel slightly off balance. And then you gain balance for a moment, ta and a little off balance, da -di, or a little gracioso something, da -ya -da -da -da, and brings you back to safety. I don't know. You think you're on steady ground after that a little bit, but not really. So it's still shifting. So let's play around with that uh, aspect of the animato again. that really helps us to understand what's happening there. Good. Now at number seven, let's play around a little bit more with that idea as well. Can you decide which beats you think are pickups, which ones are the arrivals, and also which measures you feel are also the pickup measures, okay, at seven, seven to eight. Let's play seven to eight. So tell me what your choices were, Vibha. Um, well, I realized that it kind of changes from measure to measure which beats in the measure are sort of considered pickups. Mm -hmm. um, but I also realized that my sort of like natural instinct about that is more consistent than I think the music actually asks for. So mm. it feels natural to always see the sixth eighth, eighth note as being the pickup, but I don't think that's necessarily true here. For example, in the first, um, the first measure, I think actually the entire group of last three eighth notes of the measure are like the pickup into the next measure. Mm -hmm. But in the second measure, that last eighth note is really what's pushing forward. Yeah. Okay, so let's have some clarity about that in the sound, but also in the way the energy moves and rotates and turns. Sometimes the energy could twist, but move very slowly, right? Could twist a lot and move very slowly. Sometimes it could twist very little, rotate very little, but it's turning <laughs> at a very strong radius. So if you could be clear about when it's turning quickly versus when it's rotating quickly, tonally speaking. Can we try one more time from seven?
Ah, good. Much clearer. And you might change your mind about it tomorrow, which is fine. But to uh, keep your attention on that. Now, when you come here to eight, ya da 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 ti ya la la da da. Also, be a little bit clearer about the meaning of each inevitable downbeat that's coming. Okay, each one is very inevitable, but not every one is an arrival point, which is easy to do sometimes in this section, particularly. So let's start from eight to nine. Keep me in mind uh, how inevitable and landed your downbeats are going to be. Can we start right on eight? Yeah, very interesting. The downbeat you want to hesitate on is the last one. Is that correct? Yes, but I also did it. There was one other place I hesitated where I didn't want to. So, okay, that's what I was wondering about. Okay, that's okay. You'll work that out. Now, right where we start stopped. What's going to happen in your ear between D? C. sound rotates but downwards if that makes mm -hmm. sense um it's not so much i think the entire measure leads towards the c but it's less about the inner beats and more about the bigger beats mm -hmm. so there's even in the long note the d natural it's the sound is still moving but not not in a way where it has a lot of like very active internal energy and are we still in the lava land or, or is there some ocean waves happening yet? <laughs> um, I would say this definitely gets out of the region of lava and into water now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm wondering if you could evoke in our imaginations the feeling and sensation or visualization of water. Everyone hears music in a different way. Um, in this moment here, da, la, da, let it transform. I think it should be very transformative in this section. Let's do, is, are you comfortable starting right where that piano is? Or do you wanna go into it? Maybe the measure before. Let's do the measure before. Sweetie, can we try it one more time and allow for the current to actually, if you feel any disturbances in the current, I wonder if you could feel the disturbances underneath the surface, that we don't necessarily feel them as profoundly on top of the surface yet, but underneath it could be quite turbulent. And I think that that would mean that the bar length needs integrity. See if you can keep the integrity of the bar length and do the same kind of freedom within that and see what you come up with, okay? Okay, now at nine, we know what the orchestra is doing, right? What is your role, nine to 10? I think sound-wise, it needs to sort of, um, I don't think it's on top of the orchestra's melody, but it's sort of going through any little cracks or openings that it can find. It's sort of weaving its way through what the orchestra has. And are you weaving through 
passively? Are you commentating on what's happening in the orchestra? Are you an observer? What do you think? Tell me more. I think it changes from the, be the beginning of nine to where it starts to uh, lower the dynamic mar marking increases and also where it starts to gain more energy. But I think at the beginning, it's much more passive. And um, I don't think it's necessarily an observer, but it's sort of a passive participant. Mm -hmm. And then as things start to build up, it almost interjects. OK, so when that happens, left, let's shift your voice slightly, OK? And so this entire time that you're playing not always a primary or a primary role. I want you to still keep your throat chakra open, okay? Because you're still a participant, right, in the music and a very important one. So at this time, important, I think it is for you to keep your main voice still open, regardless of what's happening in your musical role in the, in the entire piece, okay? So keep your musical main voice open and try from nine to nine to 10, okay? So I appreciate how you're showing us how your role is shifting. Now, sweetie, when you play uh, many notes under a slur, and there are many different uh, ways that we can approach that, right? So let's try once, ta, ya, ta, ta, ta. Try once doing the speaking in your left hand and the singing in your bow. Speaking here, singing in the bow, okay? And then anytime you want, shift. Sing here, speak in the bow. Okay, don't tell me when you do it. Just make your own decision, okay? It's the same thing from nine. It's amazing how you can really hear the difference when you make that shift. Now, musically, so when you play at 146, I think you can be even more courageous about how that third eighth note kind of inserts itself into the meter. And that particular accumulation, Viva, I highly recommend. I know how it feels when you're playing it. it. feels like we need to do what you're doing. But try. Feel the distance from the E to the G, okay, while you're playing this passage downwards. Still hear E, that relationship. Okay, and then I think it will help you create the intensity that I know you're feeling about that passage. Play from 146.
leap, da la la da 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 da, from the C to the G. Feel the journey in both hands. Feel the journey here. Measure the journey here of the bow. Can we just practice? Ya da da la. Yes, and when you do it this time, don't test, right? Trust your muscle memory and just feel the distance, the journey of the distance, okay? Good, let's try it once where we do our left hand. So when I studied with um, Ruggiero Ricci, he used to always make me do uh, these blind tests. He'd say, play G. And he'd make me play and they go, play B. <laughs> so I'd have to do it with both hands together. And I know you know how to do that too. So let's use that here. Ya da da la, bow and left hand together. Let's do it exactly together. It creates a different consonant, right? It creates a different emphasis. And with that new consonant, then you have the chance of oh, applying many different vowels. Ah, oh, you, ooh, e, however you want to do it. So I would practice that a few times. Ba -da -da -la, together, together. And then sometimes practice it first, but it's actually a very different impact when you have your left hand down already with the bow. So there's something about gathering the circles together that actually helps you bring to fruition, I think, the way you hear it. Let's try it one last time, okay? Yeah, exactly. Because if you were a cellist, you can imagine, right, that gravity would be helping you. So you can kind of use cello gravity when you're playing that too. You almost feel like the ground is behind you and use that gravity to to create that epic journey. Good. I said last, but we could do it one more time if you like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Viva. Dare greatly. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of liberating, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask me? I don't think so. That was all very clear. Okay. And Dima, do you need me to take any questions from anyone in the webinar or should we continue forward? I think at this point we can go on. I, I'm sure I will have a few questions because it's been very, very fascinating to observe you too speak your own language and so it took me a while to get on the same uh, w wave of uh, of a mental <laughs> chakra opening experience and I'm, I'm still trying to to get to this point so i have some questions for sure because it's very very interesting and uh, it's, i'm sure for many uh, participants attendees they'll, they'll they might have some questions and i welcome there in the chat but uh, perhaps uh, I just wanted to ask you because for me it was uh, quite a revelation when uh, you know, I love this piece. It's one of my favorite pieces and, and I remember when I was learning perhaps the same age when Viva is playing now. I fell in love with this music and I found that there's, there's so many uh, imaginative levels like no other music would even bring close. It's a, such a descriptive music. And then many years later, to my astonishment, I found out that this piece was written actually after a novel by Russian <laughs> classical um, writer, Ivan Turgenev. And I read it like maybe 10 years ago. And, and I realized that many things I somehow felt through the music was very descriptive. It's basically a love story. I don't know if you'd had a chance to read this in English because I read it in, in Russian. Have you? Yeah, Viva? I read a good deal of it. It's a wonderful, it's very short. Uh, it's actually a story about uh, Italian uh, noble uh, aristocratic uh, young man, two friends, and how they fell in love in, I, was, I think it was 17th century or something, somewhere in the Ferrara. So they fell in love with beautiful uh, young lady and uh, they were best friends and then they made some kind of uh, agreement whoever she will choose one will just leave alone and, and, and 
I, I think I will ask my uh, student and assistant here, Austin, maybe to send the link of this uh, story because for many attendees it will be very, uh, I think, fascinating experience to read about this piece. But it was just incredible that um, Chausson knew Turgenev and she, she, he knew actually this lady, Polina Viardov, who was very uh, quite quite a figure in the in the in the life of many musicians. She was quite a muse. So, and th this story perhaps relate to some of the family affairs, but the role the, of the violin, of this uh, very, uh, what do you say, um, mi mi mystery uh, sound, which really was created some kind of, maybe even black magic or something. So it's very dramatic, in a, in a way, I don't know, tragic, but it's a love story with many, many twists. And I, you know, I encourage everyone to read this story because it's, it, it gives incredible addition to the very descriptive music. It's something we can all relate to and perhaps find some of the myths. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I knew that, of course, you would be familiar with the piece, but some of our attendees perhaps never had that association. And I read it in Russian and then I looked up just to, just now and I, I saw that uh, there's an English translation of this as well so yes there is and so I'm um, can he share that that would be great if yes he will put it in the chat and the people yeah. uh, who are attending later they can read this yeah it is fascinating because I also didn't know about it when I was studying it when I was a young teenager mm -hmm. so it also came to my attention much much later in life and it was like what yeah Chant de l'amour triomphant. It's a piece of Tajestuishie Luvi. So the, the song of love of triomphant, whatever it's the name. Or sorry, it was the original name of the poem, and then he changed the poem symphonique, and then he left it as uh, just a poem. So it's so qu quite a piece. Quite a piece. Isn't it? And Vipa plays it quite. Yes, you're absolutely right. There's so much depth. Yeah. It's a exp very expressive. and. Uh, and so I, maybe I can uh, we can let Viba uh, to to finish this uh, session, and we'll just continue with uh, with Kati. I just because I would like to to ask Kati a few things about this process and in general this approach of uh, opening up different kind of chakras. It's something very very interesting for me, and I'm sure for many attendees. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Viba. Thank you very uh, much. Beautiful thank playing. Thank you. Thank you, Viba. So, Kathy, maybe you can, you know, I, I've known, we've known each other for so many years, I know that you have many different talents, but I, I, I didn't expect to be, you know, in the middle of this kind of uh, chakra opening <laughs> session <laughs> with you during the Payam Shasam, but it was really, really fascinating, and I'm glad we're recording this session, so I can uh, watch it again, and later on, other people will be able to to see and, and because it's really, really interesting. Everyone has different perception of, on this, on the process, how we try to bring the best out of students. And definitely I didn't expect to hear and to see it's why I think it's this, um, this opportunity brings us even closer. But I would like you to talk a little bit. When did you develop this kind of approach? Perhaps it was not through the study of, uh, with Mr. Ms. DeLay uh, perhaps sometime later, something, something else uh, uh, brought you to this kind of uh, approach, which is really very fascinating. And you said something about lateral and vertical energy. I would like you to uh, elaborate on this, please. Well, first of all, you know, I do have to share the story. It is relevant, okay, about about us meeting, because when we met which was a little after Vipa's age, actually. And I was 16, you were 17. We were so young when we met, right? Montreal Violin Competition where Dmitry Berlinski was the first prize winner. And I was just in awe of your playing. And we couldn't really speak you, to you, you. You were the, the, the second prize winner. You have to manage this. <laughs> this well. That's how we met. <laughs> and I just remember, and it's interesting to think about actually, Vipa, because like we couldn't really speak to each other yet the language but we were trying to speak to each other um I was trying to explain what it was about your playing that was so captivating and in a way you can't really describe it and sometimes you try to describe it and the teachers were trying to describe something that sometimes feels undescribable by words 
And, um, and then through the years, you and I talk a lot about music, right? As when we were in school and Juilliard and Aspen Music Festival. And, and at that time, when I was studying with Miss DeLay, um, when I met you in, in Montreal, I was studying with Ruggiero Ricci, who was a big force in my life. I studied with him officially for four and a half years. Here he, in Michigan, you studied at the University of Michigan? Yeah, not at the school. I was still in high school, but he was my private teacher from age 13 to 17 and a half. You are, you are originally from Michigan, right? I mean, how lucky am I that he dropped into my hometown in Ann Arbor when I was a teenager. And those lessons were three hours long and they were about technique. You know, he just drilled me on technique for like an hour and Paganini and Bach and concertos. And he made me learn like 50 concerti and then he made me relearn them all, you know, in four years, like two or three times. So it was like a really different kind of boot camp. But he taught me very much about how to listen and he had me listen to a lot of different people. So when I met you, that was the mindset. But when I went to Delay, her mindset was very, very different. And she would always say, oh, you have such a strong foundation, honey. Your teachers or early teachers are so good. That was so important. And I'm thinking, yeah, but I also practice eight hours a day, you know? So, it, you know, I think it's like the combination of the work and the teaching. And she would always talk about my first teacher. She wouldn't talk about Ricci as much, interestingly. And now that I'm teaching, I understand why she talks about that foundational teaching as being so important because Ricci taught me so much about how to listen. And Delay, as you know, taught us all how to think for ourselves. And she didn't tell us what to think, but she taught us how to start thinking for yourself. And sometimes it was so difficult in the lessons because she wouldn't just give you the answer, right? She'd give you clues and make you frustrated and then make you go home and think about it. And sometimes you wouldn't come up with an answer for eight or 10 years, but, but it was that striving for it. And during that time, um, I was looking for more because I felt actually funny enough, I felt really comfortable with my left hand. I felt really comfortable and I felt really uncomfortable with my bow and weirdly uncomfortable with my sound, which I feel like changed a lot since the years that I knew you. And I think it was in that discomfort that I started to look for other ways. And when I gave birth to my son, six months after that, I couldn't play because my ligaments never went back. So I don't think you knew this about me, but I literally couldn't play the violin for six months because the ligaments were still elongated. So during that time, I had to get help. And during that help, I became a big fan of Pilates. I became a big yoga fanatic, anything holistic to help me come back to my health after that time. And then I really connected to those ideas and I started to do Tai Chi, of energy, healing, um, anything that helped with the health because I had all kinds of issues with my lungs and modern medicine wasn't helping. It was actually all this energy work that actually helped to heal my body. And so then it informs you. And so that was a big part of my life really for the last 20 maybe years, um, this kind of thinking and exploration. Does that answer your question, Dina? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's very, it, it's, uh, it just gives me uh, a wish that I, I could uh, ask you many, many more questions. Just, just one question I wanted to ask you, that you, it seems like you find a common uh, ground with the student. She hasn't been your student for a long time. How long? Two years. Uh, two years, years already. So. Years, yeah, um, almost three. Yeah, so that she somehow can already differentiate the different energies and uh, apply them to to the playing. Yes, I mean, I've talked about this with some of my students um, and other teachers. As you know, sometimes it takes a whole year to really understand the language of a new teacher, right? And to help a student feel safe within the space that you created to explore together, because I guess the lesson is really like an experimental lab. You know, you're experimenting together vulnerably and honestly and sincerely. So it can take a long time to build that kind of, that trust. Um, and when I choose students, actually, I look for that. It's like, are we going to build this trust? Because I'm not the right teacher for everybody. So I wouldn't want to take a student where I think, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be good for them, right? So, so you have to make that guess whether you think you can help and whether it's going to be a fit. So with Deepa and Sammy, who we have today, it's like, yeah, this is, 
going to be very productive if we can grow together. Um, but, but as you can see, she's very sensitive. And, and I think musicians are very sensitive beings. We have the five senses. And then, you know, I like to joke that we have like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 other senses that we can't really <laughs> name and hold on to, but they're there. <laughs> you know, we know what they are. So um, I think our, as artists, right, as musicians, as sensitive beings, we're always going into that, that layer of our soul and our spirit, whether we want to or not, we, we do and we need to for the music's sake. And so when we go deeper and deeper and deeper and uncover the layers, then we start to find more and more truths. And maybe what we think is the truth today could change tomorrow, but just staying attentive to that on a daily basis and noticing and not judging it, I think is so an important part of I'm hoping of the lesson structure. No, I think it's wonderful because being aware of this and trying to be aware from the different perception when we practice the instrument, because it's, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. We discover so many things we have, we have an intuition and through this incredible music, we're able to have a glimpse of something which is absolute there somewhere and mm -hmm. we become a part of this. We open, we open our our mm -hmm. brain, our soul, and I mean, it's it's wonderful that you can be articulated about this. And, and definitely, would like I would like to continue this conversation. Perhaps we can let uh, the Semi Andonian, right, if I pronounce his name right, to get ready and to play uh, part of Bach Chikon for you. And then afterwards, perhaps we'll have some more questions and we can continue our discussion. Thank you so much, Katya. That sounds great, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sammy. Hello, Sammy. Hi, Miss Joe. How are you? Hi, Sammy. Good to see you again. Great to see you as well. Sammy and Donian is going to play. We 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 actually created an, an excerpt that we could both swallow and live with because who wants to stop in the middle of the Chacon or the Chacon poem? But we found a spot. And what you may not all know about Sammy is, well, first of all, he is a first year master student at Juilliard and he has a heart of gold. <laughs> so heart of gold, Sammy is going to play some Bach Chacon. <laughs> Thank you. 
you, Sammy. Great to hear you again <laughs> this week. You, you're always so um, personal and sincere in your playing. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, and the golden heart comes comes through too. <laughs> okay, Sammy. So uh, you know the architecture of the piece inside out, and you have it mapped out, and you know all the different routes that you might take. And so I know you have a very detailed uh, bird's eye view and topographical view of the, of the music. So let's actually just take one territory out for a second and work on the the range of possibilities within one, let's say, one musical landscape. So I'm gonna check the beginning of the major, okay? <laughs> Play for me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, eight measures, okay? Uh, eyes closed, senses open. How about you turn one quarter degree away from me? So turn your scroll towards, yeah, that's good. Good, right? Even more maybe, turn your scroll even more towards the painting. Yeah, okay. So you're really not aware of the screen, okay? You're more aware of what's behind you right now and what's right in front of you and the wall to the left, okay? And let's imagine, you know, you have no roof on your house. Okay, it's a roofless house. So the blue sky is up above. Okay, so the sound is going to travel eternally forever in this cosmic direction, okay, which I think is like upwards, right? Universal. Okay, and play for me embracing the possibility of space between beat one and beat two in every bar. That's all. That's all we're doing. Okay. Just live with that. Okay, we're gonna do another version. And when we talk about space between beat one and beat two, I'd like you to this time include what happens at the end of beat one to inspire the space between beat one and beat two. Okay, that's all, that's all we're gonna do. <laughs> You just noticed, right? That's a, a different feeling. Okay, now this time with your eyes closed, I want you to, I know we've worked on this, let your inner ear be both ears, okay? So then that might inspire the question, where's my external ear? Uh, let's let it be something you sense, okay? With your sixth sense, that's your external ear. Your internal ear is going to be both of these ears. Let's experiment. Let's see what that feels like. I don't know. Let's try.
just breathe that in for a second. That's all, that was a really different feeling for you, I think, Sammy. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go on even further, tell me in, in a one word what the first one was to you. Before I was just using my inner ears? Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe sort of like divided attention a little bit. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you when you were trying to listen between beat one and beat two? Um, I think that allowed me to kind of feel like I was molding time a little bit more. I mean, that's what I was literally doing, but that I could create and release tension between the beats. Um, and that also helped me kind of access that more cosmic feeling like there's like there's no roof or something. <laughs> And what happened when we included the end of beat one into your life? I think that allowed that artistic shaping to feel more inevitable, maybe, mm -hmm. because it was relating from the end of one beat to the beginning of the next. And when you when you visualize your sound, I mean, we don't usually visualize the sound. I think we often feel the vibrations, right? But if you were to visualize your sound, what would it look like coming out of your violin? And then where does it end up? Is it is it like permeating out all the sides of the wood and then seeping into the universe? Or do you feel like it's going out your F holes? Like, how do you, how do you picture it? Um, I think I've always thought of the vibrations. I, um, well, coming towards me, I've always felt kind of on my collarbone. Um, mm -hmm. But then going out to the audience, I think I've always felt it probably through the front, you know, a lot of teachers will say to the back of the hall or to the people in the balcony. So I think I've kind of thought of it that way. But I think maybe something a little bit more circular and more um, all encompassing maybe will help me access that feeling when I close my eyes a little bit. Let's experiment, Sammy, because I think you feel vibrations really naturally because your body has its own natural vibrations, right? And I like to think the wood also does too. And then when we pull the bow across, then we activate, right? These existing vibrations. So if you can imagine that all the particles of the wood, including your scroll, they are vibrating. Like if we were in person, I, like, I often like to touch the scroll and see how much is vibrating when people are playing. But so if it's optimally vibrating, the scroll will be very actively vibrating. So imagine all of it, chin rest, bridge, the ribs. Um, and then let's relate it to your body, front body, back body, neck, ribs, rib cage, legs, feet, that all the particles in your body are also vibrating in all directions. And see how it feels to kind of engage those two concepts simultaneously, okay? Eyes closed, eyes open, however you want to do it, facing me or not, it's up to you. I mean, what's that experience like? Um, I think it allowed me to physically let go a little bit more as much as closing my eyes maybe helps me mentally let go. Um, because of course, if you squeeze the violin or the bow, you can't feel them vibrating. So, or it keeps them from vibrating. So I think that really helps me feel kind of flowing and floating and not squeezing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one last experiment with this section, and then I'll let you go do something else. Let's see if we can feel that level of freedom, but let's see if we wanted to add in, in the middle of all that, this like, you know, this pointed channel. Um, 
and maybe that pointed channel is also prism prism like so it's still refracting light but it's, it's there's something very focused about it at the same time let's see if we could lure that in to the sound while you still feel this vibration okay let's invite it in Interestingly, when you did that, the chamber music aspect of the voices working with each other shifted dramatically. I felt like it was very clear string quartet playing at that moment, or a little bit choral. In other parts that you played today, it sounded very organ-like, so I, I applaud you for that. So just take note of what that exercise um, informed you about, yeah? physically, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, logically, subconsciously, because subconsciously there's processing going on, right? So just let yourself sleep on it. Now let's try something different. Your Bariolage section was so beautiful. I thought I was going to faint. It was just so poignant. Let's try this experiment um, in a different way, starting at the very opening. I'm wondering if you could channel your inner violist a little bit more at the beginning. And then when we come to this dotted rhythm, dum, ta -da -dee, ya -dum, invite a certain kind of uh, nobility, a nobleness, noble feeling and dignity, even though you're also trying to lilt the music. Okay, so careful that when we lilt, it doesn't start to sound casual. Um, in that section. So can you play for me from the very beginning until, you know, two or three lines, okay? Sammy. And when you're doing this, this time your inner viola, yeah, your inner violist was starting to have a more, um, it's interesting, it was, it's almost like it had a better listening voice, but at the same, it was also kind of leading and guiding. So I think that's an ideal uh, viola voice in the string quartet, right? One that's listening, but also guiding. Now, when you play your soprano line, sometimes I think that you leave our soprano line in a place where then you could catch where it's going next a little bit more clearly. For example, seven uh, tayum Like you left it here and then catch on the A where it's going to end up. Okay, I know you're listening that way, but maybe a little bit clearer there. We'll try one last time, same, same amount. <laughs>
much clearer. Okay, so how does it feel to you right now? Good. I feel like between thinking about um, my inner violist and my inner soprano, that it's creating kind of like a dialogue a little bit between my bass and my soprano that maybe could have been heightened. Um, and so I think it feels like I can create more nuance from the harmony even more that way. Um, so it feels nice. It feels improvisatory. That's great because, you know, we spend so much time on the bass line, which is so essential and important and necessary, but it's easy to, to lose track of our middle voices. And then you know what it's like to sit in the second violin position and to be really an excellent second violinist, right? You have to be very active uh, participant. So when you're playing this music, you can also pay attention to being a very active second violin participant, you know, and I can think of all my favorite string quartets, right? Some really imaginative, creative second violin playing, okay? Okay, so um, lastly, let's try, I'd like to play um, starting at measure 65. You know, I think, Bach was adventurous, right? He's an adventurer. I feel like here you could bring that aspect out in the way you treat the slurs, the way you improvise. So there's, a, even though it's expected, I mean, we know the harmony, but there's still an element of surprise and adventure in the music. Not everyone knows what the next variation is going to be. So if you could help highlight the surprise element. I think that will help this section 65. So now that I've said that to you, have I just ignited your spirit or your mind or your emotions or your logic or your subconscious self? What has just been ignited? I'm curious, I don't know. Um, can I do a combo? Yeah. <laughs> I would say my spirit and in combination with some logic, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I think emotionally speaking, I was aware of the feeling of adventure and the slurs and everything. And so I think it for it to come across more strongly that I have to use spirit and then also logic in terms of maybe just giving the page a second glance at which, how long is this slur, how long is that slur, and kind of using that to inspire what I do. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think those two probably. And are you hearing it right now as you're, as you're looking at the music? Mm -hmm. you're, you're hearing it inside, right, in your inner voice? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what tempo are you hearing it in? Maybe like slightly under tempo, like 80% tempo, to kind of feel feel that what's between the notes a little. So when you're hearing it, you're also visualizing or are you having a feeling of muscle memory of what it would feel like to play it slowly? I think probably muscle memory that then kind of inspires like a like a spirit emotional response a little bit and then also looking at the page i think i'm visualizing it also because i am looking at it but okay let's experiment sammy look at the page visualize and if you can let's try to uh, individualize your listening okay for a moment not to be attached to the muscle memory for a moment. Okay, so let's see if we can just draw ourselves into the focus of what it sounds like mm -hmm. in your mind's ear. And then let's just play it first, okay?
it's a really different feeling, right? To just focus on what it sounds like. Okay, this time, do it again and focus on what it sounds like. And how should we say this? Like in your third person view, visualize your hands working with the music. Try it from the third person, okay? that way Sammy oh my gosh what does it feel like to you um well I think in this which is probably why we're working on it but in this passage I think I'm maybe particularly attached to my muscle memory mm -hmm. in maybe a way that's not super reliable mm -hmm. and so when you asked me to think about my touch from a third person point of view, it maybe exposed a little bit of muscle memory leniency that I was taking. taking. Um, but at the same time, I think um, it also helped to uh, go back to what we were doing before in terms of like acknowledging the adventurous spirit and all of those things so that I'm not just relying on doing it the same way every time, I yeah. think. So let's do one last experiment with this. Because you have complete control. It's like a radio. You have complete control over the volume in your head, I think, right? We can control how loud we hear something, I, I, I hope, and how soft we hear it and the nuances in between loud and soft. So let's use a similar dial, if there were one, to adjust the speed in which you're hearing it and let it not be attached to what it feels like to play it slower. Okay, ready? So in your internal dial, let's just lower it down to 85% as you said, speed, right? Okay, play from that perspective. And whatever tempo it happens to be is okay. Well, I think it's going to be the one that you're listening to, right? Because it's all about the listening, right? It's music. So you're gonna trust what you're hearing to guide what your hands are going to do. What did you notice? What are you observing? I think that helped me to kind of recalibrate maybe and reconnect with my original um, visualization, how I hear the passage in my head. And I think it just gave me that extra space to kind of find the intensity of the passage of the variation, I think the expressive intensity. And did you play the speed that you heard in your head before you started? Mm, most of the time. I, I wasn't able to rein it in 100%, but I'd say 70, 80% of the time. Okay, it's interesting to note, right? How we're listening and that we actually have a lot of control over how we're listening and what we're listening to and at what speed. Because sometimes we feel like we're at the mercy of, oh, well, this is how I sing it. Mm -hmm. is it is it really how I sing it or is that just what I think I'm singing in my head right and sometimes you sing it out loud it's like no that's that's not that doesn't sound like what I was just singing internally so take note of that when you're practicing certain passages especially ones that are invigorated in this way or 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 excited 
or um, ignited, energized. I think it's useful. And of course, it's something that's more melodic and lyrical too. I think it's useful in both cases. Okay. So I just want to check, Dima, if we have time to do one more spot, or would you like me to? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. So Sammy, let's do one last spot. Okay. Let's start from um, measure 89. And let's see, yeah, let's see if you can evoke a little Segovia for me. Just a little guitar, and play with the you know, musical constellation that you can create via a guitar-like um, touch on the violin. Sometimes I used to practice it like guitar when I was bored. <laughs> like, how, how else can I practice this <laughs> when I was a teenager? But you don't have to do that right now. But let's try that out just for like eight bars or so. one more time and this time you heard how you just played it so internally replay that in your head and pits yum bum 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 just the g string notes mm -hmm, just the g string for now how you have such a long view. Now this time when you're pissing, Sammy, let's not hook your thumb onto the fingerboard. I want you to go free, completely free, and um, try to use your, uh, or I should say, think of the pits as a bow stroke. Tum, bum, 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 bum. So the length of your bow stroke and the touch and the depth and elasticity of your bow stroke will, will influence the sound, okay? So like all those beautiful, you know, Casals pitzes, you'll feel the resistance against the string before you release. So careful not to pitz on the surface of the string. Try just a couple pitzes and feel the resistance. Yeah, that's it. Now this time, feel a lateral motion against the string and against the fingerboard while you create your stroke with the resistance. Good, now try a short stroke with a long resonance. Now try a short stroke that's close to the string with a lot of resonance. Mm. 
Nice. Okay, ready? G string top, G string top, G string top. Pits. It's a very personal moment, isn't it? To, to play that and pits it. So now, remember that tactile sensation of personalizing how much you were pulling, right? how short the stroke was or how long and how you felt the fingerboard against your finger. So with that intimacy of touch, imagine that that's what your bow hairs are doing against your string and that the stick itself is very vulnerable. Let the stick be vulnerable. Let it have its own life, which it does right now, and allow it to live fully, okay, with no, no suppression. Okay, let's try just a few measures and you can go slower if you like. that sounded Sammy so you can practice that and it'll impact the way you treat all the voices in your in your in your intimate string quartet da, da, dee, da, da. so when people ask me well how do I deal with the string changes I said well let's practice pizzicato and find the the sensitivity of the touch and connect it to where you hear it because I know how sensitive you are as a musician and artist and I think you could pay attention to what you do in the middle voices, but also the top. Ta ta ti ta ti ta ti da tom. And this is one way of practicing it. Okay. 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 Any okay. questions, Sammy? No, I don't think so. I think it was really good to work on connecting with my inner ear with this piece. I think it's really helpful. Uh, you're very. Uh, open-minded, open-hearted, and open-spirited <laughs> artists. So it's always fun to, to explore together. Thank you very much, Ms. Cho. Always good to see you, Sammy. Likewise. See you soon. Okay, see you soon. Thank you, Sammy. You were playing. It was wonderful to see you have this kind of engaging session of uh, exploring together and such a friendly conversation. It's, uh, it's wonderful to observe, Kathy, your, some of your students and your co collaboration. It's very special, I think. Special atmosphere you're trying to create. And I'm sure for everyone, it's, it's important to see that the, your style of work has this kind of uh, very productive experience and your students are responding so well. And uh, it's very enjoyable and creative process. I think it's it's it's... It's really, it's very important that we have a chance to have this sneak <laughs> <laughs> preview of the hard work you've been doing for many years. Thank you, Sammy. Hope Thanks, Sammy. You so you, you've been uh, teaching for how many years together? Over 20 years already? Actually, over 25, we discovered the other day when I was talking to uh, a member of the staff at Juilliard. So I started really young. And if you remember, I think, were you at Juilliard in 93, 94 at that time? Uh, yes, I think, yeah. You were there because that was the first year they started the Starling Fellowship. Remember, Miss DeLay started the Starling Fellowship in 93 and, yeah, 93 to 94. And Robert Chen and I were the first two Starling Fellows. And that program still goes on. So I've had some former students of mine and, uh, and current students have that fellowship 
since. And, um, and I remember how shocked we were because we were, you know, 23 years old. And she says, I'd like you to start teaching. And I remember I was thinking, Oh, I I don't think I've really taught before. How am I going to teach your students? And she's like, and she would just smile like me. He's like, Oh, sugar plum, you learn by doing (laughs) or something like that, that I translated in my head. And we would meet every week um, actually to talk about teaching. And it was so fascinating because she gave me some really great advice um, at that time. And so and then she gave me four of her students and she says, okay, you're going to work with him every week. And I did that for two years. And then a pre-college faculty position opened up two years later. And then she said, I, I think you're going to like teaching. So, so she basically gave me that job at Juilliard in the pre-college. And then that's how it started. And I started teaching and I started you know, teaching more students, more students and started doing the college. But those meetings with her, Dima, were so interesting because she would tell so many stories about her students in the past to show me how you can't just teach by book you know you have to keep an open mind and I'm sure so many right of your guests have said this about her that it was really important to teach each person uniquely yeah I think it was her strength Uh, she was uh, able to to acknowledge certain strength and perhaps weaknesses in every student Mm -hmm. to see how one can engage uh, both qualities so they can work together so it's it's um it's i think it's very important to know one's strength not only certain um, things one needs to improve but to know why one has special voice or special talent and what what is this what comes natural and perhaps other things needs to be work in terms of to supplement that talent and of course everyone has a di- absolutely different different um, angle in doing what we do and it's why it's so wonderful our profession has so many different way of explaining and then interpreting the music and and that's it's a collaborative process because we learn from each other we learn from the recordings mm-hmm. some of the recordings somehow it sometimes can or live performances of course it's the most uh, inspiring thing but even during this um, zoom webinars for me and i'm sure for many other people it was really fascinating to see how every every distinguished guest was able to maybe to to open up a little little uh different different uh, way of perceiving even the same pieces uh, or the process and uh, I have to tell you that your session was really really something I didn't expect <laughs> it was very fascinating and I, I'm looking forward talking to you uh, more about the way you develop this kind of approach and definitely watching this one more time so I can I really <laughs> <laughs> expect certain things and try to follow your instruction because it seems like your students are perfectly in tune what you're saying them it's it's wonderful that you're able to create this kind of common ground which is really it's not very direct and play this way or that way you just suggest things and and they enjoy trying and experimenting and it's i think it's very special uh, process you create with the students and apparently you know you're very successful you have so many students you've been uh, teaching for quite few years and the fact that you have I don't know you said how many students you have 34 yeah, for the for, for the for, for the fact that you know they, they want to learn something from you and they uh, somehow feel that you bring certain new dimensions in their uh, development and um, I salute you because I, I know you know from within I've been teaching also for many years how how sometimes it's um you know uh not only only responsibility but it's that that every student needs a different approach and you have to engage in that process to find a best way to open up certain doors for every every individual Uh, you can you can know everything but another thing is you have to try to 
to to reach the understanding of the student and and especially when you're able to discover something and it seems like you're looking for this discovery every lesson every moment this makes it only very proactive and thing and it brings so much energy for you because you're smiling it's wonderful to see you <laughs> just to hear the reaction from the students and you right away you're enjoying that reaction of the change and the students are also smile and it's what it's wonderful i think it's incredible that you're able to develop this very unique approach because i haven't seen or heard anyone work in this kind of manner so i really appreciate that you were so kind and willing to share this it seems like it's very natural for you you're doing on your own and with us it's, it has no not not real we didn't intimidate <laughs> your privacy <laughs> so this is the best thing so I, I wanted to ask you perhaps maybe you can share something else about miss delay uh, some some of the stories something which really comes to your mind uh, because you spent how many years did you spend when when did you study started studying with miss delay 1988 i studied with her for eight years and then i started teaching as her assistant pretty much right after that so I and basically till she passed away I feel like we kept talking and working and discussing students and I, I have some very strong words that are in my head all the time talk about inner ears <laughs> like I can't get her voice out of my head certain things she would just say for example she would say if some if somebody was behaving not well to her like a parent she said if a parent of a child pre-college student isn't behaving well just, just remember, there's a little sickness in there, so they're not well. <laughs> and that's all she would say. She'd just look at me, and then I would go, but what do you mean by that? And I would argue and argue and argue and argue, and she would just sit there and smile and not say anything else. Or she would say, um, remember, <laughs> actually, one of my favorite memories, and I've told all my students this story because it's so good. She would, When I was a student, I played Peggy 89 for her, and at the end of the lesson, it was a midnight lesson. And, I, and I'd been waiting for hours for my lesson. And it was like a short lesson. And she closed the music. Or no, she actually said to me, oh, the, the notes are out of tune. So I put arrows up and down on them. So, you know, look at the music. And she's like, there's an arrow on almost every note. And she closed the music and handed it to me. And I went home crushed. And then I realized it was her way of saying, you need to listen better. You need to do better with your listening. Because I had worked really hard on it. I thought it was good. That was that. But then when I started teaching, she gave me a very different story, which was she had a student who would never lift their violin off. It was always down here, you know, hair covered. They wouldn't look up ever. And I actually ended up with a student exactly like this. And she said she tried everything. I tried to this way, that way to get him to hold the violin up. Wouldn't do it. So she said, so after the eighth or ninth lesson came in and I said, oh, it's just wonderful. Are you holding your violin up so well? And she said she never had to say it again. And fascinatingly, in my first year of teaching, I ended up with a student exactly like this. Mm -hmm. And I was tearing my hair. I couldn't figure out a way to inspire them to not, you know, literally be staring at the ground while they were playing. And I remembered that story. And so after the eighth or ninth lesson of tearing my hair out, I decided to try it. And of course it worked. And I called her right away. I said, well, Ms. DeLay, I begrudgingly tell you that you were right. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to argue with her so much when she was alive. And of course she was right about all the advice she gave me, but I was so young and stupid and I wasn't listening. And, and I was just arguing a lot. Um, but I guess it forced me to to think about things and 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 grow up <laughs> eventually and learn for myself. You also work uh, very closely with uh, Mr. Perelman. Yes, we share some students at Juilliard and I've uh, been teaching at his summer music program for 14 years. Um, so yeah, it's a wonderful program. We, we had uh, some students performing on this webinar actually who are part of the program as well and I've heard that it's a it's very wonderful Shelter Island. Oh, it's a terrific, magical program. And it's small, it's intimate. Everyone works together as a team. You know, you know, May community is key uh, within the studio, within the family, within um, the school. 
and any kind of summer program. And so there's a real community feel. And so any place like that, that promotes this teamwork is, you know, A plus in my mind. And it's wonderful because there's lots of chamber music, right? And so yeah. it's a celebration for teenagers, yeah. especially for teenager kids to have uh, this chance to work with all of you. Yeah, chamber music. And they learn to play and perform. Oh, yeah. And they sing, sing in chorus, you know, and they play ping pong together and you know, everything. <laughs> so it's lovely. It is lovely. It's wonderful. Thanks so much, Kathy. It was real. It was real joy to to be able to absorb your teaching and to reconnect and to hear wonderful stories. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate your time and your willingness to support this. You know, Ms. Delay was graduate of Michigan State in 1937. I think it's a wonderful program. I'm really happy you're doing Professor Blinsky. <laughs> really happy you asked me to do it and I'm really glad that it worked out. And you mentioned actually Robert Chan. Robert Chan is going to be our guest uh, in early April. Oh, good. Terrific. I'm in touch with Robert and we have a few more um, excellent uh, guest artists. Uh, Kurt Sussman's house is going to do it in um, in two weeks, exactly in two weeks. And then we have a few more artists, uh, confirm one, Kola Blaher. Have you, you, you haven't met him in, in, in Jordan, no, he was, he was mm -hmm. older. Uh, very, because I was, I never met him, but we had several discussions and I'm looking forward to his um, participation because um, he, he was for uh, ex extended time, uh, concert master of Berlin Philharmonic with Abada. Mm -hmm. Now he's doing lots of teaching in Germany in Berlin and He's leading orchestra, so I'm sure uh, he has something to share with his experience and also, also with his studies of Midulay. And then Joseph Swenson, you, you know Joseph, of course. Oh, nice. Oh, my I, think we, we, I met him when we were together in, in Aspen in 91, that summer. I met Joseph. He's a quite uh, incredible figure as a violinist, uh, conductor, composer. So he, he's, he's, we were supposed to do a session in early January with some of his students from Royal uh, Academy in Scotland. Mm -hmm. and then we had this lockdown in England and some of the students weren't able to come. So we have to postpone it and hopefully we'll do it when they reopen sometime uh, late April. But he would like, he suggested that he wants to work with some of his students uh, from, from the conservatory and perhaps even coaching some of the chamber music. So we'll see how it goes. But definitely it's something which gives me a great joy to uh, to look forward to next uh, webinars, next uh, guest artists, and uh, it was incredible. It has been an incredible journey, and I'm really thankful to you and all the guest artists, to the, all the attendees, because there's so many people who attend these webinars, and then a later later day, the Violin Channel was gracious, graciously um, streaming some of the. Uh, webinar sessions so I would like to also thank the Violin Channel and all the supporters supporters my former student Austin Burkett who is uh, who's been helping with uh, artwork and video editing <laughs> uh, who is still with us today and uh, also Lori Harris our uh, professor of psychology who is a great supporter of uh, College of Music and uh, I really appreciate his support in this series so Kathy wonderful to see you you too you soon and until the next time I would like to say to everyone thank you and see you soon thank okay. you and see you next time bye bye Kathy bye bye everyone bye